Hello everyone, welcome to the third episode of our Sustainability and Climate Change in NI webinar series. Thank you very much for joining us. Today's guest speaker is Sarah Lynch, our Environmental Manager here at Queen's. Sarah holds an undergraduate degree in Geography as well as a Master's degree in Applied Environmental Science. Before taking on the role of Environmental Manager at Queen's, Sarah occupied a number of positions within the sustainability sector, including Sustainable Indicators Research Assistant at Sustainable NI, STEM Project Officer for Armagh City and District Council, and Principal Environmental Consultant at WYG. Before I let Sarah take over, I'd like to remind you that the microphones and video should be inactive for the duration of the webinar. The webinar is also being recorded and will be made available via the Biological Sciences website and social media channels. Following this presentation, a Q&A session will be facilitated. You can submit a question by typing it in the Q&A chat box or by raising your hand and asking your question verbally. Please wait to be called before asking a verbal question and remember to unmute your microphone. Okay, so I'll not take up any more of your time and I'll hand over to Sarah. Okay, thank you, uh, Tanisha. I'm just going to share my screen now with um, some slides and um, take you through some of the programmes and initiatives we've been undertaking at Queen's. Um, yeah, my name is Sarah Lynch. I'm the Environmental Manager at Queen's and I'm based in the Estates Directorate um, within Queen's, which is in the admin building, for those of you who know it. Um, just um, facing out onto the Lanyon. And um, today I'm going to give you um, an overview of the various actions we've been taking at Queen's to tackle climate change. So I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of the university, um, the approach that we've taken to tackling climate change at Queen's um, and look at it um, through um, a range um, of areas. So first of all, um, for those of you who um, don't know Queen's or maybe are at Queen's but aren't familiar with just how big we are, we are um, a really large university um, and in many, uh, sometimes when we're explaining Queen's, it, it's like we're a small town. We have over 250 buildings, um, we cover 60 hectares um, and 85% of our buildings are in one of three conservation areas um, within Belfast. Um, and although we're um, primarily located um, in South Belfast, we also have locations at ESIT, which is a Titanic quarter, um, Malone Playing Fields, um, and also further afield in Port Ferry. And we have over 22,000 uh, students at the university, and we have um, 3,500 staff. So that's, that's a lot of people using our buildings um, and interacting on our state on a day-to-day -day basis. So why is climate action, why is climate change important for Queen's? Well, um, I go back to what um, our vision um, for Queen's is, the 2020 vision, which was set out in our most recent um, corporate plan. And that talks about a world-class international university supporting outstanding um, students and staff and world-class facilities, but most importantly for me, focused on the needs of society. Um, and if we think about what the needs of society are, um, that's a prosperous, that's a happy, um, that's um, a clean um, place um, to live. And climate change is one of the greatest risks and threats um, to us, um, to that um, and to the needs of society. So as a university, um, it's imperative that we um, look at ways of tackling climate change within our own day-to-day -day operations um, and also in our teaching and our learning. Why do we need to act on climate change? Well, um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change really laid it out in their most recent report, which said that we needed to reduce carbon emissions by 45% by 2030 if we were going to stop irreversible change. Um, alongside that, the UN um, launched their Sustainable Development Goals, which was a blueprint strategy um, for making the world a better place. And those goals are to be achieved by 2030. And those are addressing global challenges um, like poverty, inequality, climate change, environmental degradation, peace and justice, which are all um, integrally linked and can't really be looked at in isolation. Alongside that, we have the UK's recent commitment to net zero um, and the Climate Change Act binding targets of 2008, which came before that. But more and more, and particularly in the last two years, we've seen a real increase in the consciousness of our staff, our students and our local community in wanting um, to take action on climate change. 
um, wanting, uh, we had the student climate strikes um, in September last year. Um, we've also had like the Blue Planet effect, as we call it, you know, the David Attenborough documentary, which really raised the profile of the impact of single use plastic and the impact it has on our oceans and our marine life. And also the impact that climate change is having on our oceans and raising our sea levels. Within Queen's, we have our own student union um, and the climate action group within it. who have come up with a Green New Deal for the university, which makes a number of proposals as to how they would like to see um, the university um, tackle climate change and integrate sustainability um, more fully throughout the university. And our staff and students have expectations now of what the university should be doing in relation to climate change um, and the environment. And it's not that they didn't have those beforehand, but in the last 10 years, there's definitely been a, a big, big increase in that awareness and that expectation that as a large institution um, who are here to tackle social need, we need to be doing something about that. And I came across this quote when I was doing putting this presentation together, and it comes from the IPPC report um, back in 2019. Now it was in French, and I hope this is the right translation. <clears throat> but really, it's saying it's important not merely to foresee the future, but to bring it about. And it's not enough to know that climate change is happening and, and do nothing about it or to just let it happen, but to use that information to really make change and stop it and do whatever it, was, it, it is within our um, reach and with, um, in our roles and what we do um, to tackle it uh, and prevent it. So our approach in acting on climate change within Queen's um, really covers, I guess, four main areas. Um, the teaching and learning um, and the courses um, and the learning opportunities that are afforded to our students and also our staff um, through our operations, um, our day-to-day, -day, um, how we operate our buildings, um, how we operate our accommodation um, and how we engage and raise awareness amongst our staff and students on the various ways they can be more climate conscious in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, through our outreach um, activities, um, our collaborations, because climate change doesn't know any boundaries. And as a university, we can't do anything about this in isolation. We need to work with others and be part of a greater movement to tackle climate change and the impact that it's going to have. And then finally, our research um, and how we, the solutions um, to climate change, understanding it and, and what we can do to address it um, and green our world and also what we can do to adapt to climate change because we know that it is happening. So I'm going to take you through just some of the things that we're doing um, on each of those areas. I primarily work on the operations side of things so that's probably where you'll find I have the most knowledge um, but um, I've tried also um, throughout this presentation to give you a bit of an overview as to what we're doing um, across the other areas. So our journey with carbon reduction from an operations um, point of view probably really started about 10 years ago when we developed our university carbon um, management plan, which is really a carbon reduction strategy for the university. And it was a 10 year plan and the aim was to become a low carbon organisation. Now, when you talk about carbon, we're now talking about zero carbon, but 10 years ago, low carbon organisation was the, the language that was being talked about. And our target was really to align with um, the government um, targets and the targets set within the Climate Change Act and that was to reduce our carbon emissions by 21% based on a 2008 uh, baseline by 2020. And in doing that we were looking at our carbon footprint from the perspective of how much energy we were using within our buildings, how much waste we were generating um, and water we were using and then the corresponding um, carbon associated with that. And we were given substantial funding to achieve that. And it, it's a positive story to tell in that we've outperformed um, our target um, last year in 2017 to 2018. We've actually outperformed it um, and over um, decreased our emissions by 22.71%, which is a really positive story to tell, but it's only the start of the journey. Um, to date, we have been very focused on our, what we call our scope two emissions, our direct emissions on site, 
But as we know, your carbon footprint takes in much more of that. Um, we need to start looking at our indirect sources, like our business travel, our commuter travel, and our procurement. And so when we look at our carbon footprint, you can see at the moment, what we know is that most of it um, is tied up in the heating of our buildings and the uh, operation of our lights, of our equipment um, and our labs. Um, uh, a small proportion then um, is related to water and to waste. But as I said, the unknown um, is our business travel, our commuter travel and our procurement. And I guess it's really only in the last um, two years, 18 months, um, that people have really started to talk about carbon emissions relating to travel and commuter travel and procurement as being part of your carbon footprint within our sector and also within you know, industry. Um, it's definitely been um, a positive, I would say, and that we're able to talk about carbon in the wider sense of how we're having an impact and not just limit it, limiting it to um, our electricity usage and the more obvious examples. Because actually, when you look at it, the emissions associated with our business travel, what we buy um, and how we travel to the university are actually likely to be a lot more than the emissions that we have directly on site from fuel and electricity. The challenges, these are areas that are um, much more difficult to influence um, and that's something that we will be looking at um, over the next couple of months. So from uh, an operations point of view, there are various ways we've been trying to reduce our um, carbon emissions to date um, through the design and construction of our buildings, through the investment in low carbon and energy efficient technologies, um, through sustainable travel, um, by implementing waste and recycling um, strategies across the university and through our staff and student engagement programs. So in investing in our infrastructure, we've invested substantially in low carbon and energy efficiency if efficient technologies across the university. We have a ring fence green revolving fund, fund um, which has invested 2.8 million um, in energy conservation projects. So that's things like uh, in improving our lighting, improving our insulation in our buildings, um, and also 6.7 million spent on combined heat power projects. Um, so that's a low carbon technology, which has helped us to significantly reduce um, our carbon emissions here at Queen's. Alongside that, um, sustainable design and low carbon design is a big part um, of the design of our buildings. So when we're um, looking at a new build, we set the standard of BREAM Excellent, which is an international um, standard for sustainable design. Um, and for all our refurbishments, we set the design standard of BREAM Very Good. And the types of things that we've been including there to make them low carbon um, buildings is the use of geothermal heat pumps at our School of Biological Sciences. Um, we have rainwater harvesting in our Welcome Wilson Centre on the Health Science Campus, using our LED lighting throughout new buildings and refurbishments and the incorporation of a green roof within our new computer science building. So a lot of standard things that we will put in place um, with regards to energy efficient technology technologies. And then there are a whole range of other things that we'll also add in to reduce the carbon footprint of that building. From a waste and recycling perspective, then there's a wide range of items that we recycle across campus. Bottles, paper, books, polystyrene. Um, we're always trying to find avenues for waste that can't be recycled. And for what can't be recycled, the majority of that is now actually going for energy um, recovery. Um, we have a number of promotions to try and reduce the waste in the first place across the university, trying to encourage people to use reusable cups, reusable water bottles. We have a furniture reuse por portal where people could go on to and get furniture before they go and buy it brand new. And this year we established a plastic reduction group in uh, partnership with our campus food and drinks colleagues. And that was in response to staff and students um, requests that we have a serious look and tackle the use of single use plastic um, on campus where we can. I'm working in partnership with our students union and our Elms uh, accommodate our colleagues in Elms Village. We organised um, a big give collection um, across the university at the end of term. And that's to help staff, staff or students, but mainly students who are leaving accommodation 
um, giving them the opportunity to donate items for reuse or to charity or for recycling rather than um, disposing of them um, to the bin. And that's also done in partnership with a number um, of charities, including the British Heart Foundation. So as a result, we've got a good recycle and recovery rate of 86% and over 1,300 tonnes diverted from landfill. We're also trying to encourage sustainable travel. So we've got cycling facilities across the university, a number of public transport incentives, a cycle to work scheme for employees where they can buy um, a bike through um, our salary sacrifice scheme. We have various um, bike doctor sessions throughout the year where people can get maintenance. Um, done on their bike um, and also we work in partnership with Big Loop Bikes um, who are a social enterprise who work with um, people who have been through the justice system to help them get back into work um, and they do that by developing their skills in refurb and bikes and they are then sold back um, to our students. So it's a really positive social um, economy project which is also really good for the environment. So 86% of our students are currently um, traveling sustainably. That's when they could come to university pre-COVID. And um, we hope that it will return to that when we get back to normal times. And um, just under 70% of our staff also travel sustainably. So that's people who aren't traveling to the university in single use occupancy cars. Also loads happening in biodiversity on site. Um, we have our tree nursery, we have our allotment, and we have some images here of just some of the things that we have been um, involved in. So we've got good partnerships with um, our students up in Elms, um, our gardeners um, and conservation volunteers have been helping them build bird boxes which have been erected throughout Elms and throughout um, the university. We had a group of students this year um, who did a biodiversity survey um, of the university um, and have been pulling together um, the report on that. Um, and recent last year we were awarded our Green Flag Award, which is um, a national accreditation for public spaces. And that was for the Lanyon and that was for the good work that's done there to maintain it and keep it an, an open um, space which is safe to use but is also enhancing biodiversity. And we're looking to enhance biodiversity wherever we can. The, the photograph in the far right hand corner is actually a small space behind our School of Music and it's our sound garden. Um, and it, it's a small space in an otherwise pretty concrete area. So anywhere we can find um, our biodiversity hotspots um, um, we are working with our gardeners to see where they can go in and really enhance biodiversity um, on site. Also working with Campus Food and Drink um, to try and encourage the use uh, of reusable cups um, and introduce more sustainable practices within that. Um, and we've, uh, we've also become a fair trade university. We've been a fair trade university for about the last 10 years. Key part of what we've been doing is trying to empower our staff and students to make a difference. And that's through the creation of green networks. We have a sustainability champion network across the university, staff um, and students, different levels within the university, all coming together to try and encourage good environmental practices within their areas and get involved in um, action on climate change on campus. Be that um, getting involved in a workshop, clean up of this, uh, around the university, planting trees or organising an awareness session within um, their own area. And we have a number of programmes that we run to facilitate that. We have the Queen's Sustainability Award for our um, school directorates and departments. We have the leadership programme and we have the Green Fund, which has been a remarkable success in recent years. Um, and so we've had different events, as I said, as well throughout the year, and there's some images of the key things that, that people have been doing um, to take action, everything from food banks to cleanups, um, to involving um, local schools, um, to building, making bird um, seed feeders um, in Elms Village, to putting up the bird boxes, to working with um, our library to try and make our staff and our students aware of just the volume of plastic bottles that um, they generate. Um, just a whole wide range of projects led by staff and students across the university to increase awareness um, on sustainability, climate change um, and the environment. Um, one of the um, real successes in recent years has been our leadership programme of which Shannon and Tanisha um, have been um, members of and graduated through. 
Um, and this is a, a program which runs alongside um, the degree um, of our students, um, but gives them uh, an employability accreditation at the end of it. Um, and it really um, helps the student helps students go through a number of workshops um, to develop their leadership skills, their communication skills, and also their um, awareness um, of uh, climate change, the environment, and helping them really to organise and take action. Um, so we go through project management, event planning, delivery, um, and they also develop um, auditing skills. And it's been really um, great at bringing students who probably wouldn't have met each other um, otherwise, but have a real interest in the environment, bringing them together to help them bring their ideas um, to life at the university, um, whilst um, having it as an addition to their degree and develop their employability skills. Um, we also have the Green Fund, um, which is helping our staff and students make a difference by actually giving them the funding and the resources to make their ideas happen on site. So we had lots of staff and students which had brilliant ideas and they wanted to get involved with them, but they didn't have the money or the resource um, to bring them, um, make them happen. So when we launched the uh, Green Fund um, about a year and a half ago, we've had over 80 staff and student um, projects um, that have um, come through to us. Um, and a whole um, selection of them. Some of them have been very biodiversity focused, some of them have been awareness. Um, one of them, the Marine Explorers Outreach Programme, is all about bringing uh, students um, from inner city areas out to Port of Ferry to learn about the marine environment, learn about climate change, and just give them a totally different perspective um, on their world um, and help them you know, to, to widen their experience so they can bring that then um, as they move through their life and through their education. Um, also working for with PPRC, our Plastic Polymer Research um, Centre um, in the School of Mechanical and Aerospace. Um, and they're very focused on manufacturing plastic, which is a bit controversial um, in some words, but really about trying to promote the benefits of plastic and what they're actually doing to try and research and find out how we can um, reduce the environmental impact um, of plastic and realise um, it for what it is actually worth and a real a proper resource that we need to use, but which we need to dispose of and manage um, properly. And we actually have an event um, happening with them on the 14th of September that we'll be promoting. And one of the really lovely Green Fund projects, um, which I'm particularly proud of, of our students, um, because they've led this, um, was our Elms Village allotment. So we had uh, a number of students who came together as part of the Green Fund, um, our Green Fund request for applications, who were also environmental leadership um, students, um, and they and decided that they wanted to set up an allotment. Um, we had an allotment previously up at Elms Village, but it hadn't really taken off and it was very staff led. So they took on to build the beds, plant the beds out, um, plant um, fruit trees um, and really took ownership of it um, and made it happen. I guess that's the difference the Green Fund has made. We've been able to give the students um, responsibility um, to get on site and deliver it and all the skills um, and experience that brings with it. Um, and we did that in partnership with conservation volunteers who were able to come along and um, do some, uh, give some guidance and awareness to the students as well on what they should plant and when they should plant it. Um, and also um, it had the support um, of Elms Village and it's been really successful and they have had um, a whole um, harvest um, um, over the summer there, which they've been able to share with the residents um, at Elms Village. Um, and out of that then came a society, the Green at Queen Society, which has ensured then that we have longevity and a legacy associated with the allotment so that there's students there to keep taking um, that on. And we hope that that is something that will grow and develop um, over the years. From a teaching and learning perspective then, um, we have a wide range of sustainability and climate change related undergrad and postgrad courses here at Queen's across all three of our faculties. Um, and I won't even begin to list them, um, but they're all available there um, to view online. Um, alongside um, those um, courses, we also have, um, addition to that, um, we've had climate literacy training provided to our first year students. That was a new initiative rolled out by the School of Natural and Built Environment. 
So last year, the first year cohort which came into school of natural built environment, um, were all provided with one day's climate literacy training supported by workshops on how they could begin to apply the climate literacy training to their courses and their understanding um, of um, what, uh, how they could apply that um, in their course. Um, and one of the really interesting and exciting things that is, is going to be happening hopefully in the coming months um, is the commitment um, to integrate sustainability within our curriculum um, through the new corporate plan. So our um, <clears throat> Vice Chancellor um, at recent um, talks just before COVID um, was talking about the integration of the sustainable development goals across the university and particularly within the curriculum. Um, and that will be coming through um, in a new corporate plan, which will be hopefully um, coming out in the coming months. That, that's a real, really exciting and putting sustainability at the heart um, uh, of what the university is doing. We also um, have a number of living lab projects where we have students um, from uh, our the university um, and staff using the university estate and the local community to inform their studies on climate change policy um, and to gain, uh, gain real experience in a live environment of um, projects which are actually can be, we can learn from um, and which they can take away from as something that has actually made an improvement. So some of those, for example, would be um, utilization of CHP and our energy systems um, within the curriculum. So working with the School of Chemistry and Chemical Engineering, we have provided access to the students um, to see our um, combined heat power units in operation, understand how they actually work and get some of the data coming through from them to understand how um, we are making a carbon saving from them. And that's all um, happening in real time and on our site. So the students aren't actually having to leave. They're using um, the state infrastructure infrastructure as, as part of their learning experience. Um, we've worked in the past the School of Natural and Built Environment who have done um, a condition survey of our Lanyon building and that highlighted improvements which then we knew we needed to make um, and um, was used to inform uh, our understanding of the building um, and what improvements needed to be made um, to that. But also gave our academics and our students the chance to work with um, a building on site on campus that they could see um, and be part of um, and understand how it, how it was actually the improvements then could be applied um, in a real project. Um, we've also been working with the School of Biological Sciences um, to allow them access um, to some of our areas around Lennoxville and various parts of the state where they've been surveying and mapping the ecology at various locations around the university. From a research perspective, we have a number of research centres and research projects all um, focused on tackling climate change. Um, we have the Centre for Sustainable Equality and Climate Action, which is led by John Barry and Amanda Slevin, and that's focusing on um, climate justice and the action that needs to be taken around that. We have Environmental Chain Resilience and Re Research uh, Cluster which is um, led by Jennifer McKinley from the Natural Built Environment and is a multidisciplinary um, research cluster. We have the Centre for Advanced um, Sustainable Energy, which is a collaborative um, research project around marine renewable energy, bioenergy, and is trying um, to partner up industry partners with funding to help them develop those renewable technologies here in Northern Ireland. Um, the Research Sustainable Energy Research Centre um, which is also looking at how uh, technology and bioenergy can all um, help and uh, tackle climate change and, and improve our environmental impact. The Bryden Centre, which is looking at marine and bioenergy research, and the Accept Transitions uh, project, which is um, looking at how we can find ways um, of turning our waste um, into a resource. Um, so it's a circular economy uh, project and it's multidisciplinary. It's looking at um, a whole wide range of schools are involved. It's looking at the behavioural side, the psychology um, side of it, as well as the practical element as to how we can actually recycle um, some of those materials in a more efficient way so that we can use them as a resource. That's just a taster of the research. There's so much more um, happening. 
um, and we have um, a very good um, website um, that we can point you to around um, our social charter um, projects, which many of these are, um, which can give you more information um, on those if you wish. Outreach and collaboration is other, also a really important part um, of what we're doing in our approach to tackle climate change. <clears throat> Um, and that's within our local communities, um, but also within um, Northern Ireland and beyond. Um, and some of the things that we've been involved in at a very local level um, is the Lennox Vale Tree Nursery, which I'll talk a wee bit more about in a second. Um, our autumn and spring community cleanups, which we do in partnership with Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful, um, our staff, our students, local residents and Belfast City Council. Um, our SU volunteer uh, group, or have a, a really great project um, which brings um, our students together and the local community together and the Belfast City Council to upgrade and improve um, the alleyways. Um, and they've been doing a great job of cleaning up alleyways and make, in the Holy Lands, making them spaces the, com the community can um, use and enjoy again, planting wildflowers, um, wall, making wall murals and really just um, making a, uh, what has been previously been um, not particularly nice space, lots of challenges um, associated with antisocial behaviour, a space where the community um, can, can use and enjoy again. <clears throat> and we've also been working, as I said, with Big Growth Bikes on the refurbishment and resale um, of bikes um, to students. Um, Lennoxville Tree Nursery um, is one of the ones um, which happened recently, um, which I think is a really lovely example of collaboration on a, a local level to tackle climate change um, and it, it shows um, how important it is um, I guess to to get together um, and talk um, and bring you know and get out of our silos um, we uh, were attending the Green Flag Awards which we hosted last year in Queens and a member of the one of our community groups Eileen Sung um, spoke to got speaking to some different conservation volunteers at that event and they were talking about potential projects they could do with the community um, and they came up with the idea with for the a tree nursery on a vacant piece of land in the Malone Road which we um, own and is quite close to San Susie Park um, and Eileen then got talking to uh, Paul Wallace our head gardener and we spoke to people within the estates um, and we were able to make it happen. So what started off as an idea and a conversation within a few months um, came to fruition. Um, and in October last year, a number of our students, along with the local residents um, and conservation volunteers, went out to Beaver Forest and collected um, acorns, which they then brought back uh, to our site at Lennoxville. We all pull together um, with our gardening team, with the staff, students, local residents to pull, build um, beds um, and fill them with soil and planted our acorns and had a really um, lovely couple of weeks on site, which we were blessed with the weather, um, just get pulling together um, to build um, this tree nursery. Um, and we hope that in the next two years that it will um, grow 2000 trees, which can then be plant it at either on the Queen site or in our local communities and various locations across campus. And this project um, is now a feeder project and part of the Belfast Million Trees project, which aims to build a million trees um, across Belfast in the next 15 years. Um, but it was a really brilliant project in pulling people together. Um, and when you can get people out of, outside of their office and outside of the normal community meetings that you might have, um, it, it really created um, a lovely environment and a really social um, opportunity um, enjoyable for everybody that was involved and I think you can see that probably from the photographs because everybody's really smiling. Collaborations we've also been involved in um, across Northern Ireland beyond um, as a university probably one of the biggest ones um, is the place-based climate action network um, and the Belfast Climate Commission. So we are one now, um, Belfast is one of three cities um, which is part of this climate action network and a climate commission has been established in each of those cities. So we now have the Belfast Climate Commission which is led by um, Gronje Long, the Resilience Commissioner. Um, but uh, the purpose of this is really to try and link 
climate policy with action on the ground. So we may have climate policy coming from Westminster um, or indeed potentially um, from our own assembly. How do we actually translate that to action on the ground, help our communities um, understand what it is that they need to do to take action? Um, and how can we uh, equip our communities to do that? Um, and from a Queen's perspective, this affords opportunities for research and teaching and learning um, from our students to, to help and work with our communities on that. Um, and it, it's a really great project for Belfast because it's been able to help us, you know, put a focus on the need um, to focus and take action on climate change as a city and not just within um, the various um, siloed organisations around the city. Belfast Million Trees has uh, is another initiative that we are involved in um, and it has stakeholders from across Belfast who have all been coming together to really work out how can we plant one million trees um, across Belfast in the next 10 years um, and it has public sector, private um, and uh, local government and NGO stakeholders involved in that um, and again it's pulling together to see what can we do um, to really take action and make things happen, not just talk about them. Let's, you know, take action on, on climate change and make a difference. And um, one of the other examples um, from a collaboration perspective um, is our Quadrop project, which is um, uh, a multidisciplinary project, a training experience um, to try and train up uh, PhDs on effective stewardship of natural capital and resource management. So, and that's involved in Queen's and the University. Queen's University and the University of Aberdeen. So there are lots of different ways um, that we are collaborating. Those um, are just um, a snapshot of some of those. So there's lots happening at Queen's around climate change, but, but what next? But one of the um, big things um, that I am kind of looking to see um, happen and will be looking with interest and hopefully will be part of is um, our new corporate plan. So the commitment within that to integrate uh, the sustainable development goals across education and indeed across the university. Um, it's an ambitious plan um, in that, you know, universities traditionally, we work um, very kind of, sometimes can be very siloed um, and work in our own areas. If we're really to integrate the SDGs and deliver on the SDGs, then we need to break down those silos um, and collaborate and work together. Um, and that will involve more multidisciplinary um, research. Um, we within the States are very focused on now developing our next 10 year climate change strategy. Um, I say we within the States, but actually it's a university wide strategy. Um, and as we move beyond it, looking at electricity and you know, our gas usage and things like that, it's actually taking in a much wider area of the university. So um, our travel, our procurement, um, our carbon sequestration, how are we going to look um, or how will we in offset potentially? I'm not a massive fan of it, but it could be something that we um, need to look at if we are to um, achieve a net zero target in the next number of years. The design and construction of our buildings, how we adapt our buildings to climate change, and then how can we link this all together? How can we link what we need to do within the university um, to our research and teaching and learning? Also really aware that we need to encourage and keep increasing the awareness and consciousness of our staff and students on the need to tackle climate change and how they can do that. And we'll be doing that by continuing to develop our engagement programs and our award schemes um, for our staff and our students. And that will form part of our uh, climate change strategy um, in the coming months. Um, really important, um, collaboration and outreach. How can we collaborate more internally, um, be that the states working with our schools and directorates, um, our schools and directorates all just working um, together to the benefit of each other so that we have impactful research which can help inform what we do within our state and which can also help our communities um, to tackle climate change. Um, but climate change, as I said, knows no boundaries um, and working on it on our own as a university is not going to um, achieve what we could actually achieve if we um, all collaborate um, and work together on it within the city of Belfast um, and beyond. 
So um, we always try to end our uh, presentations with some takeaways and some practical things that everybody can do. Um, so you might be involved in research, you might be um, have the time to go away and do some teaching and uh, inform yourself better um, or do a course on climate change. Um, but what we would say is, you know, everybody um, has a part to play and everybody um, can do something to act on climate change. Um, be that you get more informed and there's some really great resources online and really quick YouTube videos um, uh, online. Um, one particular favourite of mine is Catherine Hayhoe's and her Global Weirdings videos on YouTube, which kind of tackle climate change and um, the impact of it and what you can do in kind of bite-sized chunks in a really easy to understand way. Um, get involved, um, be that doing something within um, your local community or joining up with your green team if you're a member of staff or getting together with your friends um, and trying to do something positive for the environment. Um, try and leave your car at home and take the walk, bus um, or cycle wherever you're going. There's a new movement I think is starting to evolve around 15 minute cities um, and it's all about how we need to you know, get away from jumping in the car um, to, for those 15 minute journeys we should be using um, and designing our city so that you can walk, um, um, cycle or, or take the bus for those journeys. Um, really simple thing like using your recycling bin, something that everybody can do um, and trying to just cut down the amount of stuff um, and disposables that we use, be that your coffee cup or be that just the amount of stuff that you buy on a day-to-day on -day basis. And it's really coming back um, to this final note, um, which is um, a favourite quote of mine. Um, I have uh, young children and we are big fans of Dr Seuss. And this quote's from the Lorax, um, which um, is a great um, book and I think it's also now full. Um, but unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. And it's really, you know, everybody has a part to play in making a difference. Um, and collectively, um, if we all pull together, um, we can make that difference. So that's everything for me. Thanks, Sarah. It's great to hear about all the initiatives that are taking place across the university and how um, staff and students can get involved. Um, if anyone has a question for Sarah, you can go ahead and type it into the Q&A chat box or raise your hand now. Just go in there in the Q&A chat box, Sarah. Okay, yep. <clears throat> um, so um, question there just to tell us more about the Queen's Sustainability Award programme and what the key aims are and who can get involved. So our Sustainability Award programme is an uh, award accreditation programme for um, our schools and directorates. Um, and it's designed to help um, our staff and our students within those directorates develop their own sustainability action plan um, for that school and directorate um, so that they can identify what the key areas um, they're having an impact on are and um, create and then an action plan over the next um, one to three years that will help, help them address those. Um, and that allows you to develop your action plan as simple as you want, be that just looking at the basic operational things that you need to do within your school and directorate or developing that further into how you can begin to be integrating sustainability and the SDGs into your curriculum um, or your research or trying to do more outreach work um, uh, to kind of reduce, increase your sustainability impact. Hey sir, I also have a question as well. Um, what, well, if you could try to pin it down to one thing, I know, I know it's quite difficult, what would be the top thing you would suggest that at the university level and the individual level, like what can be done to fight climate change? I think at a university level, um, it comes down to senior leadership and having our um, senior leadership team, our vice chancellor and our registrar um, and the, the, you know, the heads of our directorate, our directors and our heads of school being um, bought into the fact that we need to do something about this um, and committed to doing that and that that becomes part of our business, that we need to do that, that it's not just the, 
green thing that we would be nice to do, but it becomes part of what our core business is. So that when we are developing our courses and we are um, talking about communications with staff and our students, that you know the impact trying to raise their awareness of what they can do so that they're climate uh, good, climate conscious, good citizens when they leave our university and they have the skills to, to apply that. Um, and also that they're aware of what they can even just be doing it on a day-to-day -day, um, basis, but also that we're committed to doing research in that area because go back to my original point, you know, universities are all about social need. Climate change is one of the biggest things threatening people's social needs at the moment. On the individual level, um, I always go back to the fact that you just we just need to buy less stuff. If we bought less stuff, there would be less energy associated with those items in making them and then just using them and then destroying of them and the recycling or the recovery of them. That all takes up energy. If we just didn't buy half the stuff that we have in the first place, um, we wouldn't um, need to do that. No, thank you, that's great. Oh, we've got another question. Um, <clears throat> so um, has COVID-19 impacted the importance of sustainability um, to QUB? Has it increased the challenge in regards to sustainability? Um, I guess at the minute, everybody's a bit diverted by COVID-19. Um, and uh, there was, you know, pre-COVID-19, we were um, really uh, on kind of a we felt like sustainability had become a real priority for the university and we had our vice chancellor saying lots of really brilliant things about the SDGs being integrated into a corporate plan. We had a really brilliant week of Green Week events lined up to engage our staff and students. And um, we had all these plans and all these ideas and then COVID happened and everything just literally shut down and stopped. And everybody just had to reprioritize. And we have to start thinking about how we delivered our programs and how we engaged with our staff and students in a different way because you know face to face was kind of the traditional way of doing a lot of that. Um, so I think at the minute COVID has a, the priority, but I would hope that as we you know climate change hasn't gone away, and if anything, COVID has taught us how fragile our world is um, uh, to like big threats, and climate change is a big threat. Um, so I would hope that um, as we kind of enter some kind of new normality, that sustainability um, will um, be given more focus again um, as we kind of get back to a new normal. It has increased challenge in regards to sustainability. Like one of the things that we're looking at the minute is how do we travel, how do our staff and our students travel to campus? Um, and obviously public transport's taken a bit of a um, bad press at the moment. Um, the um you know and we would be and cycling um is an option but only if it's really short um journey so what we're trying to do is work with our public transport provider to see that we have as much update information that we can provide to our staff and students around public transport um but also working um with the department um, for infrastructure and trying to see how can we actually improve the cycling infrastructure around um the university because so many people did um, get into cycling over the course um, of lockdown. So we want to keep encouraging that. Um, how can we um, ensure that we have safe cycling at our university so that we can um, keep that positive behaviour that people might have um, taken during lockdown um, on board. I guess one of the other things that we found really interesting was we had loads of our staff started getting to grow your own over lockdown. Um, I think Shannon um, and Tanisha, you were both involved in that as well. Um, and actually with that created, which was a lovely online community of staff just sharing their stories of how they were getting on um, and, you know, how their kids were getting on and what they were growing, people who had never tackled a Grow Your Own project ever, including myself, um, have been growing things. We grow lettuce, um, my kids um, planted their sunflowers, they still have yet to open. But I'm hopeful that in the next cup and the next week, if this wind would go away, we will open. Um, and it's been just a, from that perspective, it was it's been a real positive in that we were able to kind of sit back as well and enjoy the environment um, and enjoy nature in a way that we probably never took the time out to before. 
Sarah, there's also a hand raised from Carla. Um, so if Carla yeah. wants to unmute her microphone, then she can ask Sarah. Maybe we'll give her a few more minutes. Are you going to go on and answer the question from Sam? Yeah. Um, so a uh, question from Sam. Um, is there a central place on the QUB website where people can find out about the sustainability work? Um, yeah, we have um, uh, pages within our estates director pages called, if you go search for sustainability at um, Queen's, um, we give an overview um, of all the things that we have been working on from an operational point of view and also trying to signpost that then through to um, research and some of the teaching and learning things that have been happening there as well. You can also follow us on Twitter at Green at Queens where we will um, signpost you to various um, things throughout um, uh, our posts throughout, uh, over the weeks and any events that were happening um, within uh, the we've organised or which others are organising that might be of interest. Um, I think the next question then is from Stefan. Um, could you tell us more if the university can become carbon neutral and is it part of the objectives? Also, how far are we to have zero waste to landfill? So um, if I take the first part of that question first about becoming carbon neutral, um, at the moment what we um, are doing is uh, kind of assessing what it would take to get us to um, carbon neutral um, and I guess I mentioned COVID, it's kind of delayed it because everybody, some people have been kind of occupied in other areas. Um, certainly our students union, um, I know they have asked that we should be setting the net zero um, carbon neutral target for 2030. Um, and at the minute what we're doing is sitting down and looking, right, if that is the target that we are setting, what are likely to be the key things that we need to do along the way um, to achieve that. But I would hope in the coming months, now that we kind of getting back to a bit of more normality, that we would be setting that target and we would be able to publicise that and um, get on board with um, delivering it. Um, delivering it is not going to be something that we, is not going to be an easy task. Um, and, you know, we have looked at what it's going to um, require um, and we're starting to look when we design our buildings now um, at what it will require to make that um, building as um, I, I struggle with zero carbon because at the minute I don't think we can actually build a zero carbon building in the way that we need a building to run. Um, but how can we make it as low carbon as possible? Um, uh, that, that's now being built into, um, it was already in our design um, focus, but it's, it's been a much greater focus now. Um, how far are we to have zero waste to landfill? Um, a lot of, uh, only a very small proportion of our waste now is going to landfill. The majority of the waste that is going to landfill is actually um, clinical waste um, or um, waste, for example, associated with um, asbestos and things like that, which have to go to a special landfill and can't be recycled. Um, the majority of our waste now is either being recycled or is going to um, energy um, recovery. Um, and that's probably where um, a lot of the waste that previously would have gone to landfill is actually now going um, to energy recovery and being changed into a refuge derived fuel which can then be used by um, cement kilns um, and industry. It's not as good as recycling it or not producing it in the first place, but it's got a much lower environmental impact um, than putting it into um, landfill. Um, I guess one of the challenges we have is that not absolutely everything can go through energy recovery. So there will always be um, items that um, can't um, actually go through that, but we will work with our waste contractor to try and maximise the amount of waste that we are recycling um, and also maximising the amount that we're recovering so that the landfill proportion um, is only um, the very bare minimum. Okay, I think Carla has a question. Have I managed to unmute it? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, perfect. Sorry. Um, just in terms of again with waste management, does Queens have 
have they adopted the waste framework directives hierarchy or are they just tackling waste from a, a recycling kind of outlook or is it also about um, like you said um, reusable cups reusable systems so for instance in the cafes having a higher scheme where you could pay a pound for the day to purchase a cup to use and then return at the end of the day is there any one looking into those kind of almost investments within the university? Yes, um, we have, uh, we would adopt the waste hierarchy, which is um, reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, and actually I think Refuse now has gone to the, the top of the list as a new one. Um, so we do as far as we can try to implement that. Um, so for example, the schemes, we do have um, coffee. If you, you, you take the example of the coffee cups, um, we are working with um, our coffee retailers on site um, to try and encourage the um, purchase of reusable cups. So they have some incentives there around um, getting free stamps, for example, at Clements or getting, um, I think it's a large, um, free large upgrade for injunction. Um, but um, one of the things we're also looking at is how we can make that more consistent across the university. And we are looking actually at a similar scheme at the moment to what you've just mentioned, the um, Cup Hire Scheme, um, which some of the universities in um, the Republic of Ireland um, are using and which, um, I can't remember the name of the university in England actually um, have and have a similar system in Bristol. Is that the system you're talking about, Caroline? Yeah, it would be, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we're looking into that at the minute and working out how that could work. Um, if we were to run with a system like that, and, and I certainly like the idea of it, we would probably be good to try and get wider buy-in from across Belfast and some of the local mm -hmm. coffee cup chains. Um, so prior to COVID, we were just sitting down to look at all this. Um, and then obviously reusable cups got a bit of a bashing um, as part of COVID. Um, but now the science has been proven that, um, you know, as long as you're taking your lid off to use a reusable cup, um, it's fine um, to use. So that's something that we are picking up and we will be um, definitely looking again. Um, some of the other re reduced schemes that we would have at the university, for example, would be um, all our um, multifunctional devices that you might see um, across the universities. Our printers um, are all now um, automatically will print you double sided. So we don't have people able to print out rings and rings of single um, sided paper and that's all set as default. Um, there are other initiatives, for example, with our cleaners. Our cleaners are all using um, reusable cloths, microfibers, which are all washed um, and that's the mop heads and different things as well. So there are initiatives like that that we've been using um, to cut down on waste um, as well as trying to recycle it. Um, the reuse scheme, for example, that I was talking about um, for our furniture is a furniture por portal portal, it kind of works, uh, you upload, if I have a table that I need to get rid of from my office but I know could be reused quite well within the university, um, I would upload that to the portal and then um, another member of staff um, could, might, would see that and say, oh, well I need that piece of furniture and they can arrange for it to be collected. So what it's trying to do is cut down on the amount of furniture that we would previously potentially have been disposing of. Um, and preventing the purchase of brand new furniture where it's not actually needed. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, um, I think from me and Stacey, I just want to say thank you very much, Sarah. It was very, very interesting and eye-opening as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. You know, hey, thanks a million. Um, it's a pleasure to do it. And thank you so much for inviting me and giving me the opportunity. Thank you. No thanks, everyone, for joining thank as everyone. well.